were at home with the sea. They played in it as soon as they could walk steadily. They worked in it. They fought in it. They developed great skills for navigating their waters and the spirit to traverse even the few large gaps that separated their island groups. Unquote. I think that's a good quote for us uh, this evening because uh, the title or the theme of this uh, panel discussion is about a people-centered blue economy. And uh, before I invite, uh, I'd said that we would, we had hoped to have uh, the director of the Australian Centre, sorry, here, but uh, we have uh, another of our Prico partners who would give, uh, invite to come and give uh, opening remarks. But before I invite her, I'd like to share that, you know, I'm also, I'm a, I'm a born and bred islander, so both my parents are from the outer islands. And you know, some, I am, this is all true. But I'm telling you, I come from the most beautiful place in Fiji. Yes. Don't believe a word that this, this lady says here. Oh, at least when she says that my place is island, because we are yeah. here. So I, so I come from um, a small island that has just four villages around. Four villages, but it's beautiful. Yes. Um, so um, with those few words, I'd like to um, invite Mrs. Susana Tisoao of the Pacific Pack 4 or Miss Susanna Tissau, apologies, um, of PAC4, the Pacific Foundation for the Advancement of Women, to come and say a few opening remarks before we then uh, start the panel. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lani. Uh, for one, coming from uh, the most ugliest island of, the world, of Fiji, uh, she has done very well for herself. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I would, uh, I'd like to say that I'm standing here on behalf of uh, Oxfam's uh, partner in this project, Raising Pacific Voices, um, and um, I'm standing on behalf of the Pacific Regional uh, NGO Alliance. Now that is a, a group of uh, uh, Pacific Regional Umbrella NGOs that uh, have their own constituencies um, in um, almost about 20 islands or 21 islands of the Pacific. Uh, they have partners and some of them uh, uh, are membership organizations. They have affiliated members in the islands. And um, we have uh, uh, decided uh, to work in partnership with um, uh, Oxfam uh, on a particular theme which had really been uh, um, central in the development of the uh, Pacific. And it's the one that is um, centered around uh, the sustainable, um, you know, in a centered around what we thought we should put first in the development of the Pacific, and that is having a sustainable Pacific Ocean. And uh, that is why we are here to talk about blue economy, because uh, that topic has really been um, coined by our government, our governments, uh, and uh, the dialogue that had been taking place, as well as the conferences and uh, what have you, uh, had really been um, uh, spearheaded by government. And uh, much of uh, the intricacies of what a blue economy means to the people of the Pacific, we are still not very sure about. We, uh, from uh, the NGOs, have always been uh, worried about the social impact of economic development. And for us, in the women organization, the women like the Pacific Foundation for the Advancement of Women, we are more worried about how the um, um, coastline uh, fish, sorry, coastal fishing uh, grounds have been um, um, affected by development and how um, the, our women have been um, uh, affected by the big fishing companies that have set up um, their um, uh, companies in the uh, Pacific, uh, which uh, to us means that if we were to just look at the blue economy from an economic point of view because we just want 
uh, economic gains all the time on all the development plans that the government uh, uh, meets out, uh, we would not be um, attending to the social um, needs of uh, the people and the livelihood of the people because for us uh, the social um, needs have always been foremost. So um, because the Pringo Alliance has always been one where this body of uh, NGOs or alliance of NGOs would come together uh, to discuss a particular issue when, it, uh, when the need arises. We find that this, uh, uh, this forum that has been organized by Oxfam uh, to be very, very useful. Uh, we were looking forward to this because uh, the more dialogue we have, the more perspectives we hear, um, we get from other people, uh, that, you know, in the true NGO way, rather than going to the big uh, five-star hotels, uh, in the big conferences that are organized by our governments, um, we thought this would be where we would get to learn more and uh, from a, a very um, friendly, if you like, a friendly, truly Pacifica uh, environment. So we want to welcome everybody on behalf of Oxfam and Pringle, we want to welcome you all again and we want to thank all of you because we know some of you are going to contribute uh, to the, the dialogue that is going to be uh, spearheaded by the panelists uh, today. We want to thank the panelists uh, for um, agreeing to come and uh, uh, to give us an insight into something which uh, many of us uh, are not very um, uh, sure about. Um, I, just one point I want to mention, and, when, um, and that is that for us women, if um, the women NGOs, when we're talking, uh, when we talk about uh, the ocean, we um, not only talking about um, the um, economic things that, uh, or our um, economic, the economic empowerment of women, not the social impact of economic development that pertain, pertaining to the development that takes place regarding uh, resources from the ocean, but we are also worried about the security, the dumping of um, a nuclear waste, the, the traveling of um, warships and uh, um, boats carrying um, um, nuclear cargoes. So those kind of things are also uh, worrying, um, are worrying things uh, that we thought we need to also talk about when we talk about blue economy. So with those words, I want to thank Oxfam for facilitating this and uh, all the best for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soal. Um, so now without further ado, I'd like to invite the panelists to uh, take their seats at the front and our, uh, our facilitators, they make their way up. I'll just introduce our facilitator. The introductions for the panelists I'll lead to, to see what I'll facilitate for the evening. So, uh, yes, if uh, our panelists could make their way to the front, uh, um, Mr. Martel, uh, Mr. Sloan, Ms. Pisa, and uh, Reverend uh, Bhagwan, thank you. Our facilitator for the evening is uh, Ms. Sima Deno, so she will be uh, facilitating the Talamoa this evening. Um, Sima is uh, formerly of, uh, was formerly the Communications and Outreach Advisor for SPREP, the South Pacific Regional Environment Program. So she's currently the Principal Consultant for Footprints in the Sand Consulting. And uh, she's had over 24 years of experience in environmental and sustainable development policy and practice with a focus on uh, corporate communication, public education, um, information and advocacy, dialogue building, and designing and facilitating solutions, focused workshops and conferences. So, um, 
So that's Sima, so she will be our facilitator this evening. And um, yes, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to... Oh, and she's also the consultant uh, with uh, WWF. Uh, so WWF is uh, Pacific is a member of the Pringle Alliance. So we had hoped that they could facilitate this, uh, this dialogue this evening, but uh, unfortunately uh, they're unavailable, so Sima has stepped in. Like I said, at the last minute and helped us out, and she'll be out to see you this evening. Over to you, Sima. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I'm a consultant, but I'm doing this uh, for WWF this evening, um, so I'm not being paid, just so that's clear. Um, and just uh, before I go into the um, task of uh, uh, introducing our uh, wonderful panelists, I'd just like to say a few words um, to get started. So on behalf of WWF, I am actually honoured to be here this evening with such an esteemed panel um, of uh, knowledgeable people. These discussions tonight are, as you've just heard, um, about a people-centred blue economy. And of course that means many things to many people. The blue economy has gained um, significant traction over the last few years. Um, as we talk a lot about what we're going to do in the face of um, climate change, um, climate change projections, the uncertainty with which Pacific Islands are dealing with. Um, we are reminded daily of the dependency of our communities and our economy on our oceans. And we um, at WWF and other organizations, we're talking about this idea of a transition to a blue economy which we, to a sustainable blue economy, which offers us a possible way towards building our island resilience in an uncertain future. Our objective tonight is to share some of the thinking around what a people-centered, sustainable blue economy might mean for us. As we've just heard from uh, Ms. Susanna, um, there, is, we are, there are concerns and we want to be able to discuss those concerns and, and really get an understanding of what we are talking about. Some of the questions we may want to ask are what a blue economy might look like for our communities? Who benefits from a blue economy? What might be some of the unintended consequences of a blue economy, of us pursuing a blue economy? What are we already doing that is contributing towards a sustainable blue economy? Because we are doing things. How do we bring it all together? And how can local communities, who are often far removed from the global, regional, and even our national discussions, how can they participate in and contribute to, obtain, to attaining a sustainable blue economy that will see benefits to them? So that is really the gist of tonight's conversation. And we are fortunate, as I have said, to have with us um, a, uh, a, I think, an esteemed group of panelists. And we thank you. We know that you have been asked the, um, quite, quite late in the piece. We thank you all for making the time uh, to be here tonight. The full bios of each panelist will be made available online. And I think many of you know the panelists. So I will simply um, keep the introduction, introductions short. And I will start uh, from the other end of the room um, with um, uh, Ms. Aliti Bunisea, who is representing the Women in Fisheries Network here in Fiji. Aliti has spent the last 20 years working on gender issues in fisheries in Fiji and throughout the Pacific Islands. She brings a strong research-based perspective on women and gender in the context of a blue economy. So we look forward very much to um, a good discussion with uh, Aliti's um, input. Um, we then have uh, Mr. James Sloan, who, as you heard, co-founded the Suva-based law firm uh, Siwatimbao and Sloan in 2005. James has a strong personal interest in environment and oceans law. He is a founding member of the Fiji Environment Law Association. Many of you will know it as FELA. And he was chair of that organization's uh, executive committee for the last 10 years. Uh, he has joined the USP as a part-time lecturer uh, teaching law of the sea at the Marine School this year in August. He will share his views and help us understand um, the legal frameworks relating to a blue economy in the Pacific and what this means for our local communities. 
No stranger to most of us is uh, uh, Mr. Francois Martel, of, who is the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Development Forum. Uh, Mr. Martel is a dual Samoan and Canadian national. He tells me to say that every time. I don't know which one he's more worried about that time. <laughs> so, uh, Talofa, uh, Francois. He is a professional forester and conservationist with more than 35 years of experience in sustainable development, forestry and climate change. Mr. Martel has been active in promoting dialogue on the transition to a blue economy in the Pacific and he hosted the region's first high-level Pacific Blue Economy Conference just last year in August, which was attended by well over 300 participants. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the report of that conference because I think there's a lot of interesting um, information that came out of, um, and discussion that came out of that particular conference. And uh, last but not least, um, I would like to introduce Mr. Um, the Reverend James Pagwan. Reverend James Pagwan is an ordained minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji. In addition to his many academic qualifications in theology, and as you heard, he's now pursuing a PhD here at the USP, uh, the Reverend James is a champion of the ocean. He is an avid stand-up paddler and a volunteer crew member on the Utoniyalo. The Reverend will help us explore concepts of ocean stewardship and custodianship from a faith-based perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see here tonight we have a, a wide range of perspectives represented and I think that everyone's really looking forward to uh, the discussions that uh, we know will ensue in the next 40 minutes or 45 minutes. But before I, I hand over or start the discussions with this group, because as you know panelists often forget that there is an audience, so I wanted to make sure that they remember that we have an audience out here and a uh, a very interesting group I can, I can see from where I'm sitting. What I'd like to do, audience, is to ask you a couple of questions and ask you to answer as a group, and I hope you will help me with this. So, you have to think very hard. The first question. Do you feel that you have a good enough understanding of the blue economy from a Pacific perspective in, to be able to explain it to someone else in your field. If you think you do have that understanding and are comfortable with the concept, raise your right hand and say I very loudly. Okay, then I have a follow-up question for you. If you are still processing what the blue economy is all about, and you are here to learn a bit more about it and perhaps ask questions on the on the concept, could you please raise your, raise your left hand and say woohoo as loudly as you can. Right. So we have a very honest group of uh, in front of us uh, panelists. So we're going to ask the panelists to make sure that they um, everything they're discussing will actually be to the benefit of our, uh, of our audience and uh, we will refrain from using too much jargon so that we can all um, participate in these discussions. Okay, so let's ask the panelists to help us out one more time. So panelists, you all have, there are three microphones and I'll hand this one over to you, um, to you uh, Reverend. Um, the first question I have for the panelists is really a very general one and just to get the ball rolling. I would like to request that you help us out by painting a picture using words of what you mean when you think about a blue economy. So I'm going to ask that you just uh, take a second to think about this and what are some of the words that come to mind when you think about a blue economy that is Pacific centered for the Pacific? You, you can start anywhere you want. <laughs> um, first, I need to apologize because I feel a bit overdressed. But if you if, if you come from Samoa, Fiji is cold, and, and tonight in particular with the breeze coming in. So my apologies for this. I, I still kept my LA, my LA shirt on. Under. But um, the blue economy. Um, 
I think the one of the reasons why we did the I, the Idaho Pacific Blue Economy Conference, and the first one to ask, actually start to debate on the issues of blue economy, is because nobody understood what we were talking about. Us, we were given a mandate, which is a mandate and a mission to enabling green and blue economies. And um, if nobody understands what the blue economy is, then we, we have a difficulty as an organization to work with, to work with local communities or, or partners across the region. So we have now a definition, and I'm, I'm glad to see that we have enough copies for you to collect the, the conference summary, because the definition is there. And I'm not going to use this definition. I will, in my view, what the blue economy is, is, in a few words, is the management, the sustainable management of natural resources that are from the ocean, the inshore and the coastal areas for the benefit of local communities and the economy of each country. So it's basically the green economy or green growth, but for marine resources in particular. Okay. This will be my first shot. Um, I, I don't know uh, what the blue economy is, um, and when I looked it up, I mean it can mean essentially something that's like saying, well, we need to green our economy, you have to have a greener, um, more sustainable economy, and that, that's one definition, or does it mean um, an economy that's sort of based on oceans resources and, you know, using our resources to make money, so for the Pacific, um, should you base your economy on the ocean and its resources? And I would probably, when I thought about it, I'd probably argue that, that already Fiji has a blue economy um, and the Pacific because we're so dependent on the oceans being clean. I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a little bit Fiji-centric here because it's where I've been, but, you know, it's why the tourists come here. They all come here to jump in the ocean. Um, it's what the communities depend on you know, the fisheries resources. So I would actually argue we already have a blue economy. We probably just need to make it a little bit bluer. Um, and in terms of what it means as a lawyer, and I'm only talking from a sort of legal perspective, but I think what is very tied to a blue economy are legal rights. Because it's on legal rights that you build economic rights. And I think rights are very important for the Pacific because you have rights in the coastal fisheries, that, that the, you, know, you have indigenous rights to traditional fishing grounds. But more than that, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably expand on it at some point this evening, but you also, in the Pacific, have very strong rights to large ocean spaces. And so that leads to the question, well, how do you benefit better from those rights? How do you build your economy to become not just sustainable use, but also um, how, does, how do Pacific economies become more sustainable? and less reliant, I guess, on, on external aid. And you can do it because there are enormous resources that you have rights to in this region. Um, but again, and I would also say the other slight issue I have with blue economy is it always looks like it comes down to dollars, and it, I don't think it, it should, because there are also lots and lots of things that you have um, that are, that are ma amazing in the Pacific, um, but it's not all about money, it's about being able to use um, an ocean and have the you know ability to, to have a clean ocean that is, is probably as, as important in my view as it is um, to provide uh, money. So sometimes economy I think gets too caught up with dollar figures, but but in short I don't know what the economy is. Okay. Maybe I'm following following up from that I'll just say that I was in the same dilemma when I was invited to come. I had to look it up and we think the whole thing again, what is really the blue economy we are trying to talk about. That was with my cap as a person who works in the communities and I've been asked to talk on, on community and institutions and all that. What does it mean to them? Because I, I know for sure if I go to a community in Fiji and start saying blue economy, it's meaningless, it doesn't mean anything. We're still trying to get around our heads around sustainable development, sustainable fisheries and all these terms that come and then there's another new term that we've added I think I'm taking that and what it really means for people, whether it's resilience, whether it's sustainability, whether it's uh, food security, whether it's uh, just uh, just management. Maybe during the session we, we can un unpack that further and talk about it.
Okay, so you see, we're highly knowledgeable on the blue economy, um, which is good because that's what we're here for. We're not going to try and define it. I think that's the important thing to put out right at the beginning. However, we also want to say that we are thinking in the same same lines, where where there is the dollar sign when we think economy, but we want to be able to move away from things that kind of thinking. We, in the old days, we talked about the three pillars. We talked about sustainable development. We got that wrong, so now we are coming up with all these other words. However, as uh, we've just heard, it is really about oceans and ocean resources and how are we going to use them in such a way, or manage them in such a way, that um, we are able to last into the future. We have sustainability in some form. So this was just to get us thinking a little bit, get you thinking perhaps as well. And uh, now I'm going to uh, put Aliti on the spot and uh, ask her uh, for her first question. Um, the way this is going to work, just uh, I should have said that earlier, is we're hoping for a bit of a dialogue so that um, each panelist can input a couple of minutes worth of um, input and then others can also join in and hopefully that way we can, all our knowledge can come out in the next 40, 45 minutes. So the first uh, um, uh, question, as I mentioned, Aliti has got a wealth of experience working with women and gender in the fisheries community. Uh, recently, Aliti, you participated in a large-scale research of women in, on women fishers across 10 provinces in Fiji. Could you please tell us a little bit about that work and what did the, the study reveal about the role of women in fisheries and in particular their contribution to, uh, to their, their livelihoods and, and to uh, the, the nation's economy, if you like. Okay, thank you. I think so, I said, I, I would like to say that maybe I'm happy that I'm speaking first. Because usually when, you, when you're talking on gender, you're usually the last person to speak. I've heard the board has talked about uh, more substantive uh, issues than the gender person comes in. But in this case, at least we're uh, speaking first. <laughs> I go back before that, we, the Women Fisheries Network was started up in the 1990s and it was just to advocate for women, to say that women are fishing. You go to communities, or you go to, when I was at SP, I used to work at SPC, when I go to countries, I was in one of the ones, and I talked to the, I saw the director of fisheries and asked him, what do the women fishers in uh, Wallis do? He said, oh, they don't fish, there, there are no women fishers here. I said, okay, maybe I wasted this trip. Then uh, we went for lunch, and then we had uh, another, a trade fossil. And I asked him, who collected the, the shells? He said, all oh, the women, that's all they do. They collect the shells, they, they catch the thread, they just collect the octopus, they go and collect all these things on the, on the beach. But you know, when, they, when the women go to collect these things, they are not collecting. They have a lot of knowledge, they have a lot of skill. You can't just go and collect a squid of octopus, you don't do that. You have to find their chain, you find the layer, you poke the head of the octopus and you pull it out and the, the eight or tentacles come out and this hang onto your hand and you turn it, the head upside out, inside out and it comes out. And then they start to make it on a rock or sand so that it doesn't grip them too much and then and they find another one. So it's a lot of skill, it's a lot of knowledge. So that's why we started, the, the, the organization started up. It was to, to find that, to at least advocate for that. We, everyone are not just collecting. They're contributing to the, to the fishery sector. And they do post harvest activities, they market, they distribute, they do a lot of things. You find them at the market every, every Saturday and Friday, selling their food. So when, you, when you're walking past them, they have a pile of seed grapes, so they have some, some crabs. It just uh, didn't uh, turn up like the day before. They had, that was hard work. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of planning. They had to go to the mangroves and find all those crabs. So after that uh, first, uh, when the network started, it went well, then uh, sort of fizzled out. I see a lot of people in, like them used to be part of it, and I see a lot of uh, people who did a lot of work in general, like uh, Susana, Tisawa, and Tokasa, and people sitting in the room. They know a lot of this work that I'm talking about. We started it up again in 2014, and that's, that's why the research came. What we wanted to find, find out was, has anything changed? What are women doing? So we went out to the market and talked to the women. A lot had changed. One of the main things that has changed that in the past, women were sort of passive. They were, they'll pick a seaweed, they'll go out fishing and all that, come to the market and sit there. In Lotoko Market, when we were there, there was a woman that, who came from uh, Tawua, and she's from Nusuri, where I'm from. And she was, some middle, she was like a middle seller. She came and she was bargaining and selling all this, all this stuff. 
and all the sellers at the market were trying to buy from her and asking her to what was interesting for me what they were saying. They did all said no no. She had the price set, she knew the party body, she wouldn't let go and she sold all the stuff. So the, the roles have changed, like the women from Yasawa with their cigarettes. They bring them in sex. And you find the buyers from Suba, they arrive at the lot of a wolf and they're trying to haggle with them, uh, 100 or 80. And they are, they'll sell it for $120. So that's all that changed. They are traders. They are not just women coming to the market to, to sit and sell. That was one main thing that we found out. The other thing is we are talking about women and fishers, women and all the work they do, but we don't have hard data to, to say this is what the women are doing. There was not enough research into the work they do. Uh, shrimps. You say, well, see women sitting on the roadside between Suba and Osori. They're selling shrimps and they're selling crabs. But, but we don't have research that tells us this is what is happening. This is where they're getting it from. Are they part of management? Is there any plan to make sure that these crabs stay in the next 10, 12 years, 15 years? And uh, the data was, was definitely missing. And if you go to a meeting and you start talking about gender and fisheries, they say, okay, get us the data. Then we can start talking. But, but that data is still not available now. We're still trying to, to get that. And there were new emerging things. But women, usually they're portrayed as... Uh, Yes, they are, as, as being weak, as usually being left behind in a lot of things, but they are not. They are very progressive in a lot of ways, and they found niches for themselves, and uh, it's finding that niche. And that's, uh, that's what came on the report. We have to find out what, what was happening. The networks. In Fiji, there's a lot of networks. The women that sell kai in Akin, in Naita Sil, down Nasori. That kai, some of those bags go down to, uh, to the Lotoko market, and they have always, they have relatives, they use the kinship. They have their, the families down in Otoka, they sell it down and send it out on the carrier and they put it in piles in, in Ma, in sorry, in Ma, Nandi and Otoka. Not so much bad because they have uh, they have freshwater mussels. Eh? And the same for cigarettes that come from Lotoka that you see at the supermarket. And the crabs that come from Motoriki and uh, the Lomaviti group. You go to Wendeli, they you see them there. They come in selling all this stuff. So the networks are there, the groupings are there, and those are the things that, some of the things that we found. Uh, thank you, Aliti. That's actually very informative and very inspiring. Uh, just wondering if anyone from the panel wanted to comment on um, uh, women's empowerment, whether at the community level or um, at other levels throughout the decision-making processes, and if uh, perhaps through your work you see that kind of thing happening uh, beyond the, you know, the officials level. I was just going to say that this is really reinforcing the fact that the blue economy ex already exists. The networks are established. And I think probably the elements that I'm missing that you were mentioning is possibly the management aspect of it to ensure that these resources that they are using, actually, they use it sustainably and they can actually uh, grow their, 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 um, their income in the future. That's, that's a comment actually that came straight from, from James. Um, from a, I suppose again, a legal perspective, if you're looking at community fisheries, often the areas are registered to uh, the Yavusa. So if women are undertaking all of these activities and they're such an important part of the fishery and they have all this knowledge, um, it was really a question, Aliti, how do you make sure that as part of that decision-making process that their opinions and their voices are taken into account in terms of what they might think about the sustainable use of the resources because obviously their businesses are dependent on it as well. Um, do you feel that their, their voices are taken into account as part of that decision-making process? And if not, what could be done to <coughs> ensure that they are? Maybe to answer that, uh... I would, uh, I think the approach will be a multi fund approach. You, one of the, I think one, one of the mistakes we do is uh, generalizing the cases in Fiji. And for example, we talk about women in Fiji not in decision making. One of the biggest confederacies in Fiji is headed by women, Rotimumu. And, so, and there are places in Fiji where women are chiefs, are leaders. And in uh, generalizing that, we don't see that there are already leadership, women in leadership in, in a lot of positions. That I think is the first thing that I want to say. And on the other extreme, the extreme end of that, then you have women that are really exposed, that are educated women, a lot of women in this room. And when I talk to women, I tell them, you know, I'm not talking about you, 
And then this group, I'm talking about that woman who's always sitting in the village. But that's a big difference for, for these women and the women in the village. And the women who is in the village, for example, a woman in Garata, I used to work in Garata, in Taylor. It's a big migrant community in Garata. Women from Motoriki, women from the islands. They're sitting there, they're fishing, but they have no voice at all. But the women in the there are different uh, decision making processes that are there that can be tapped into. And we can tap into the existing ones, which empower women. The women are already chiefs. We have their entry points. But, and all we're trying to do, and I think that's, that's why it's important to, when you talk about women and fishing, we're not just talking about women, but we're looking at women and men because these rooms are complementary. We're looking at all the wonderful groups in the community. Is that answer? <laughs> Yeah, just thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, I think, uh, <coughs> sort of, uh, it's good that great names think alike, so thank you for the question, James. Uh, <coughs> that's, where I was, that's where I was going, but, you know, given that, that women realistically are at the forefront of human security in terms of provision for the families in our, in our Pacific Island community, especially in rural areas, and, you know, this question really is around the issue of power structures and how we, how we start to look at that. And then taking that and bringing it up to the, the broader perspective of, of economies, it, it needs, it therefore highlights something that we need to be very, you know, to, to pay attention to the issue of power structures, whether it is at the grassroots level of uh, a blue economy or a macro, micro level or a macro level, as they say. So I think that's something that, that, that is something that we, we need to, to, to be aware of and keep in the back of our minds around the issue of, of decision making, but within that perspective. Yeah, thank you, Reverend. I think that's actually a really good point, place to move, move on to your question. Um, well, we won't, we won't, we'll stick with women and gender as we go through this whole discussion because I think it's a very important um, uh, sort of underlying um, point for a lot of the discussions in sustainable development and the economy. But when we say people-centered, for me, I tend to think about my individual understanding and my individual responsibilities to um, nature, to um, the ocean and so forth. But then I think, what, how do we, how do I, encourage others to take up these responsibilities as their own? And that's a bit of a challenge. And then we have people who talk about spirituality, they talk about stewardship and custodianship. And these are often words that people use to describe their personal relationship with nature and the ocean in particular. And it's, it is extremely meaningful um, to people to spend time in the ocean. There's a beautiful quote by Peli Hawafa on the pillar on the side. And we heard another quote this, uh, at the beginning of this session. But I think it is not really enough to care or spiritualize. And uh, we are going to turn to the Reverend James to discuss how these ideas can play an inspiring and proactive role in the discussions of a blue economy. Um, Reverend, what is the role of faith-based organizations in our transformation towards a blue economy? And uh, what is the, how can we build on these concepts of stewardship and custodianship in our faith-based um, organization? Okay, here begins the sermon. <clears throat> our reading today from the... Uh... <laughs> Epistle of James. Take your pick, which James. <laughs> now, um, thank you for the opportunity to 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 present some some thoughts around this. Um, I really think, you know, we, we, you mentioned some terms here, people centered, which is uh, now a, a very uh, well coined phrase. I just came from. Uh, the, a program with uh, PIDF and the UN Human Rights uh, uh, team where they signed an MOU and People Centered was written right there in the middle of the, of the Talanoa um, banner. And I want to switch that perhaps with the word life centered. And I'll tell you why in a, in a minute. And if I don't, you can remind me. Um, you know, this, the, I guess around stewardship and custodianship. 
these phrases are being used now within uh, uh, faith-based communities. Specifically here, I, I reference Christian uh, faith communities and uh, Christian theology uh, around a, 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 as a response to um, capitalism, to be honest. You know, from looking at things as uh, domination, where it's about ownership, a switching to, or a movement, not a switch, a move towards recognizing uh, a relationship. So it's about re relationality. It's about, especially here in the Pacific, recognizing uh, that we have a relationship with, with the natural world. Uh, with the land, with the Vanua, the Fenua, with the White Dewey, the Moana, the ocean, and recognizing that, that there is an intrinsic value to life that is non human. Right? So, whether it's uh, uh, the trees and the animals on the earth or the, the life that is um, the SDG 14 under, under, under the sea, under the water. But to recognize that intrinsic value because in the, in the Bible, the story of creation, everything else is made and called good. It's called good. And then at the end of the creation story, it is very good because humanity is given a responsibility. Yes, it's to work the soil, but it's also to care for what was created. And within the Christian theological understanding, there is a lot of discussion now around, you know, uh, Understanding what that means from a from a Christian perspective, for example, what does a year of jubilee mean for the environment? Letting things to regrow, how does that work, and how does that resonate with some of our traditional practices of making angolingoli tambu, so that the the, uh, the marine life can can regrow and replenish and and get its balance back. Um, so I think. Well, that's something that I want to just to say for now, and then we can add on to it later. Thank you. Um, I will, I'm sorry, I'm just processing that. Uh, <laughs> would anyone else like to comment on that? Do you have any thoughts? I, I'm actually very interested in, in what James was saying there, because he mentioned you know, the word ownership and relationship. And it, it's, it's obviously, it's a, a, a one level um, ownership, it can be a very legal term, you know, that there's a sort of philosophy of ownership that's based on Roman law, which we still, you know, have in our system, where it's the ownership of one person over a complete dominion. And what's happening with the philosophy of ownership, from a legal perspective, is they're talking about it not being owned by one person, particularly in relation to natural resources, because Ownership is actually divided. People have um, what they call different sticks in the bundle. Um, so, for example, if you take traditional fishing grounds, the traditional communities have certain ownership of rights in those grounds. It doesn't mean that they own it completely in, in law. I'm not talking about in, in terms of the way um, indigenous people think about it, but in terms of the law, they actually do have ownership, but it's shared with the state. And what we're finding with the ocean and also with other kind of, you know, enormously complicated um, environmental problems is that they can't be solved by, you know, one person or, or one organization or one international body like the UN. It actually requires, you know, immense amounts of collaboration um, between bodies and between NGOs and between people that are interested and between local communities and between the state. And it's quite interesting when you think about what, what James was saying in terms of ownership, you realize that in, in a sense everybody has to, to, to share the ownership and share the responsibility. And it's about thinking about ownership of natural resources, to my mind, in that sense. And it, it can actually work because if you have, for example, you take the, the traditional fishing grounds, there's a lot of alignment between traditional communities and the state in terms of, you know, if you think about their own interests, it's actually good for community fishing grounds to be well run, to be well resourced. I mean, it has economic value, um, it's good for tourism, it's good for food security for Fiji. So I, I would say that that's a, a really interesting concept to, to lead into that, well, how do, we, how do we kind of resolve some of the problems we have? And a lot of it is about collaboration and working together through those shared goals. So I, I thought it was a really interesting thing that um, he was saying, because I think, you know, in a way, ownership is, 
is problematic because it shouldn't belong just to one person. Um, so if we think of natural resources, they should be shared, but it also means that everybody has to take that sort of responsibility to, to work together. So thank you. And maybe just on the role of the faith-based organization, teaching at the back there is Kesa uh, Kawai and the Hill. They've done a lot of work on community-based fisheries management. And one of the things that NGOs in Fiji, I think, are very good at is they're using the, the churches to progress the work on management. Because if you go to a, 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 a Fijian community, and, and for example, Talatala, like the Revenue, they have a very influential role. And the people in communities would listen to the Talatala and listen to the church if they're not listening to the chief anymore or anybody in the village. So it, it plays that, that crucial role and, uh, and the ownership. And, we, and uh, I've heard NGOs in Fiji, because I used to do work with them, when we go to the community and we talk about the resources as we got them. It's like a bank. And uh, that bank, if you keep on withdrawing from the bank, it will run out one day. And they could uh, identify with that. And you tell them, if you do the same thing with resources, you just go and keep drawing from it, it will be depleted. They, have, they, they really identify with that. And uh, that just does play that uh, really important role. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to add, add on to what Aditi is saying. Um, you know, churches have recognized the, the need for partnership in this area. Uh, because one of the things that the churches challenge uh, non-governmental and civil society in some, some cases is it's very good to come into a community when you're project-based and then you leave. It's the church is still there when you're gone. So how do you ensure uh, continuation sustain and sustainability of, of, of the projects? Um, the, for example, the Methodist Church is partnering with WWF on, uh, on uh, theological and biblical tracts around sustainability in terms of management of the environment or care for the environment and for uh, marine resources as well. But on the, the, you know, with this, this idea of moving towards responsibility and stewardship, it's a recognition of that we are connected in a web of life or a web of creation that is bigger than just your ngolingoli or my ngolingoli or, or my vanua or my forest because of the, you know, the connection of the environment. I mean, we've got uh, uh, forestry and fisheries, they talk about ridge to reef, you know, uh, and uh, I know our, some of our friends from the marine uh, studies here at USP have been talking about what's happening to the kai. When you were talking about kai, I was thinking about this. Uh, with the research around some of the new synthetic materials that are being used as clothing, and you go up to the village and, you know, when it's washed, <laughs> it's beaten. Right? And the fibers from that then go find their way into the river and find their way down to where the freshwater mussels are. And they have scientific evidence of those fibers in the mussels. So we're starting to eat somebody's shirt from up in the village up the river. You know? So it's, it's about recognizing, trying to help people to recognize that you know, the totality of our interconnection with the environment that what we do up the river affects what happens down at, uh, down at the sea as well. Thank you. I'm going to move us along, but um, this is obviously a very interesting um, discussion and hopefully it will carry on into the next few minutes. So one of the realities that quickly becomes evident in any discussion on management of marine and, and ocean resources or any natural resources is that of how traditional users and communities, who are also often the resource owners, are impacted by international agreements and national and regional laws and regulations. At least that's what I think. Um, so this question is for James Sloan. Um, we, um, we know this is a complex issue. What happens at the international level, the regulations, the legislations, they will impact, of course, on our people at the community level, at the local level. But in terms of a blue economy, what does this mean? Uh, perhaps, James, you could uh, help us along by discussing some of the key legal instruments that might shape our local community access to ocean resources. Starting from there, and we can take that further. I'll try. Um... I've actually got uh, just a couple of slides. Um, it's, it, 
we were told not to do long presentations on this, but um, that is a picture of the Pacific or the South, uh, the Western Pacific, and you can see um, obviously Australia and Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, and then you have all of the Pacific Island states, and you can see it shaded in sort of cream. Those are all of the EEZs that the Pacific Islands um, have rights to. And I don't know, I mean, so I'm sort of starting from the international um, framework here. Because it's through the Law of the Sea Convention that essentially uh, divides up the ocean into various zones and it accords certain rights to those zones. So what we have on this slide here are enormous um, ocean areas that Pacific Islands have the exclusive rights to. Um, now, it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a sort of slightly legalistic concept here, but they have sovereign rights, they don't have sovereignty. But essentially that means that Pacific Islands can set the rules regarding how those areas of ocean are um, exploited in terms you know, for economic value, but also how they're conserved and managed. So um, when you realize that, it's, it's a really important thing because it shows you, you know, how powerful and how, how, you know, how much in the way of rights Pacific Islands have to enormous ocean spaces. But the important thing to remember in those ocean spaces, um, they, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a problem with the law of the sea, and that's that um, you know, it's supposed to regulate uses between all the states in the world, because obviously the, the oceans are, are massive and everybody has rights in them. But um, under the law of the sea, if Pacific islands can't use or what, what's known as the total allowable catch, so basically scientists assess how much you can catch out of those areas. Now, under the law of the sea, if Pacific islands can't catch all of that capacity, they have to allow other distant water fishing nations to come in and catch up to the total allowable capacity. So you can't necessarily exclude people. I mean, Australia get around this problem because they have enormous capacity in terms of their fishing food, so they don't actually have to allow anybody else in. But under the current law of the sea regime, the Pacific Islands have to let other fishing boats into their areas to catch fish. But they can set the rules about how those fish are caught, what sort of gear is used when they fish, the sort of conservation and management measures. So you can see that within those areas, Pacific Islands have enormous power to set the rules about how it's used. So one of the, one of the, the, the I suppose, the main points from a, a legal perspective is that Pacific Islands um, can act together to set those rules, and there's enormous work that can be done to help um, national governments basically set those rules to conserve and manage in the interest of Pacific Islands. Because obviously, we've heard already that, you know, and James was talking about this, that, you know, ocean spaces are connected. So what happens in these areas is incredibly important to what happens as well in the community, because fish obviously don't respect the zonal boundaries that the law of the sea have put in place. They swim all over the place. So healthier EEZs um, will benefit your communities, your coastal areas, but also if they're well managed, um, you'll, you know, Pacific Islands will, will essentially they'll be able to make more money from it. But it's a very big challenge to figure out from a governance perspective, how do you get more money from those fisheries back into those Pacific nations. And there are lots of problems with the law of the sea, but that's the kind of the overall framework. Um, and then I think I had another slide. Um, right, that one is actually just Fiji. So I'm Fiji focused here, but it gives you an idea that you can see, I think within that blue shaded area, you can see Viti level, you can see Vano level. Um, and that shaded blue area is all of Fiji's archipelagic waters. Now, Fiji is one of 22 states worldwide that has uh, archipelagic waters, and you have complete sovereignty inside those areas. And it's inside those archipelagic waters that most of the traditional fishing grounds are. Then you have a, an area of 12 nautical miles from the archipelagic baselines, which is your territorial sea, so another zone, where again, Fiji has complete sovereignty. So again, Fiji national laws apply. And then outside there is your EZ. So in terms of what Fiji has, it has 1.2 million kilometers squared of ocean space. And that means that you own the exclusive rights to that ocean space right the way through the water column, um, onto the seabed, sea floor. If there was any minerals in the sea floor, you own the rights to those as well. So an enormous challenge is, well, how, do, how, do, how does Fiji and how does the rest of the Pacific manage those resources 
in a sustainable way. Um, and then, of course, uh, in terms of the community, within the, the area that you have complete sovereignty, which means that the, the state makes the, the rules or the laws, you have your traditional fishing grounds. So essentially, those are the ways that the law of the sea divides the ocean up. It's not necessarily the best way to manage the ocean, because these are split into zones that uh, lawyers and geographers have kind of got together and, and drew. It's not based on any kind of ecosystem, you know, there's no, you know, the, the newer concepts or the, the concepts that have been around a while now around ecosystem-based management obviously don't necessarily respect uh, those zones. But nevertheless, that's what we have in terms of the international framework. Any questions on that? Or from the panel, would you? James, if you could tell us, um, are all the boundaries have already been agreed. My understanding was that we still have in the Pacific uh, EEZ boundaries that have not been de delineated or agreed between two countries. Um, I think most of them have, but some are not, which means uh, some difficulties at the legal level as well. There, um, essentially what the Law of the Sea Convention does is it sets down the rules and then states can then claim those boundaries up to a limit of 200 nautical miles. So that's why your EZs are so, so large in the Pacific, because your, the countries are so far apart that you can claim almost up to the 200 nautical miles. But there are disputes, because Fiji can claim one boundary, and I think Tonga has claimed another. Um, but that, that's only a dispute at the international level between states. But the Law of the Sea Convention has a dispute resolution mechanism that, that will be used. But as things stand, those are the claimed EZ. So it's, it's, it's by operation of what they would call positive law that you make these claims to, to ocean space and then you have those rights within it. Does that answer the question? Now I actually understand why Samoa has got the smallest EZ in the world because they're in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so I have a question, James. Um, Basically, so we've, we've talked about this from an international perspective and, of course, bringing it to the national mm. level. Basically, you're saying that we have a lot of responsibility for a very large amount of ocean and we can make those rules. Now, so going from that, mm. what would be the role of civil society in terms of, you know, getting our governments to perhaps make those rules and thinking about the regulations and when we get into new ventures, for example, what, you know, is there a role for civil society and how would they go about playing that? In Fiji, let's focus on Fiji. Well, I think the first thing to say is that civil society already plays an enormous role in, in all of these areas. So um, if you look at the archipelagic sea where you have complete territorial sovereignty into the territorial waters, Already community, I mean, CSOs are working with communities, um, often it's site-based or you have Flemmer that's working with, you know, literally um, almost every community putting in place sort of fisheries, you know, community-based fisheries management. But it actually goes, CSOs actually help all the way through the process. So if you go right up to the international level, it looks like the Law of the Sea Convention is just between the states, but actually at that state level, at the state process level, which is right up at, the, say, the UN or where the UN is having conferences or particular treaties are being negotiated between um, states in terms of you know, how they will help to conserve or manage. Then CSOs are playing a vital role there as well um, in terms of you know, being able to provide technical expertise into that process. Um, I mean, as, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, so I would say actually CSOs are already involved heavily in this area. Um, there, there are some, you know, there are always criticisms. Could they coordinate a bit better? Could they collaborate a bit better? Could they share information a bit more? Um, and also, I, I think for the Pacific, it's, it's also about, to some extent, realizing that governments, too, um, are not well resourced. So you have, obviously, the state represents um, everybody. Uh, CSOs might be taking a particular perspective. But it's figuring out how do you align the goals with, um, you know, so for example in the Pacific, if we accept that it's incredibly important to have, you know, clean oceans and sustainable use of resources, how do CSOs align with government? 
and assist government to make the right decisions. Because the way oceans governance is moving is, is away from this sort of zonal approach. So the zonal approach gives you the, the areas where you have your rights and you can, you can make legislation. But what the scientists are saying, and the people that are really um, know a lot more about fisheries management and, and ecosystems than I do, they're saying it's not the best way to do it. You need to do more integrated oceans planning. So I think CSOs could play an enormous role there in helping governments with resources and planning for better integrated oceans use that would take account of communities, take account of traditional rights, take account of the role of women in communities. So I think that, that would be my area that I think that we should probably focus on and also explain to government, look, it might not be the best idea to make money from fishing licenses. I mean, it's easy, you can sit back and you can license people to come in and you get quick, a quick buck, but is that the best long-term solution for the Pacific? So I, I would say um, there's a lot of value in integrated oceans management and sort of more marine spatial planning and working out how better to, you know, use the oceans in a more holistic way. But the, but the reason I was sort of talking about the legal rights is because it, it shows you that already under the Law of the Sea Convention, Pacific Islands have these rights. So it's about, I guess, waking people up to that fact that you have these rights. So Fiji, 1.2 million kilometers squared, gives each Fiji citizen an enormous stake, stake already in a very large area. And it's all of those resources in that area. So Fiji citizens have all got, or should be having a say in how those resources are used. And, you know, what what should our governments be doing to better protect it and conserve it and manage it for the future. So I think CSOs can play a, a huge role in creating those decision-making processes that involve everyone. Absolutely, yeah. You said it again. Good name. No, <clears throat> but I, I just want to add on to that. Uh, I, I'm just coming from my other, another hat, the Utuniala tight uniform that barely fits. Um, you know, the other side of it is the monitoring and, you know, how we cover this much area to protect it. Um, when we sail just from here to, to the Lomai Viti group, we can see the long line vessels that have come in at night when no one's looking or when no one can see them and do their fishing. fishing. I mean, we're logging these things as we go along, we share the information, you know, sometimes we cut the lines just to tell them that, you know, just go back to your wherever, your, get outside the easy. Um, but the role that we, 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 we need to be able to play in assisting the monitoring uh, with FLEMA, with other community organizations and reporting mechanism, that's very important. And I still cannot understand why as a maritime nation we have such a small navy. to emphasize the, the role of CSOs and NGOs in all these areas. Um, before, before, for those who don't know, I, I actually uh, was working for Conservation International, just one of those NGOs that are involved at the global, at the global level and at local level. And uh, the role that they play together with the Nature Conservancy, WWF, WCS, and others at the global level <coughs> Is also reflect is, is actually ref is a reflection of the expertise that they gain from the countries where they normally work, and um, one of the key elements there is 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 having the capacity to learn from other experiences and exchanges with, for example, countries in the Caribbean, countries in countries in the in the Indian Ocean, and to see how uh, some specific techniques related to uh, fishing protection conservation blue carbon can actually be uh, implemented uh, in, in the countries of the Pacific. Um, and of course, uh, there were also, and we talked about the, uh, the FLMMA, which I believe would be, constitute probably a strong, strong uh, framework for a sustainable blue economy at community level already, already established. And I think, and I've met recently somebody from Madagascar who was in charge of the LMME um, uh, network there. I'm not going to focus too much on this because uh, I see you as in there and has been a, a proponent of the LMMAs for, uh, for many years. But I think this is really, really important. And this was started really in the context of, of if I remember, it's FSPI, am I, am I correct, you? Uh, 
in part, and, and other organizations have actually set up the NMLA concept to the point where it is. So the CSOs have a global uh, potential to work, uh, and actually at the community level, their delivery mechanism and the experience that they have um, actually uh, allows them a far better uh, level of intervention into into the communities, in the communities, in, in, in my view. That, that despite the fact that sometimes it's still based on a project based or a timeline of three to five years that donors still continue to actually focus on hoping that projects will be sustainable after three years. And we all know it's not working that way. For those who have experience of that. Thank you, Francois. Um, we've kind of reached, we're reaching the end of our 45 minutes allocated to the, the dialogue. I just wanted to ask if um, anybody wanted to add to uh, the comments in the last few minutes. Maybe just to add to the discussion on the all other legal aspects and the and the people at the community level is maybe in doing all the work that we are doing is looking at the drive, what is what drives people to to keep on using the resources and and the use of what uh, the Reverend was referring to custodianship because we do all this we do all this community based work and the people know that they are custodians they know that the resources are theirs and all that but the driving factors what is driving the use of the resources they can't get out of that cycle of poverty they, they need the money they keep doing what they're not supposed to be doing the question is how do we then convince how do we convince them how do we make sure that uh, community based management for example includes women right at the beginning and women because the women are the people who are going to be using the resources the most sometimes they are busy cooking or catering when we are doing the training for everybody else on a community based for community based training. Those kind of little things that, that come in the end and then also to just ask the question, what are the driving forces when the big own resources that they say we have all this at our disposal, we are supposed to be the stewards of it. Or what 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 is happening that's uh, not uh, making it right for us? I think that is a very um, very good point at which to wrap up this discussion because that is really the crux of it, isn't it? It is, it is what are the drivers? What is making people do, well, whether it's the wrong thing or doing things that perhaps are limiting their, um, their futures at, at all levels of community? And perhaps that is really what the blue economy is, the sustainable blue economy is about. I think we need to start using the word, I was very impressed here that uh, um, Francois did use, the sustainable blue economy. Um, I know WWF uh, insists on sustainable blue economy because, as we heard, blue economy can terrify us is it just using resources, but it's not. We, we understand we are talking about sustainable blue economies. Um, oh, okay, so I have a questions. always listen to what people say. So um, I, I will just uh, continue this um, for a couple um, more minutes. We have, what we have now is, um, let me just give me a sec. Okay, lovely. Um, oh, sorry about that. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we'll, we'll thank the panelists for the extremely interesting um, discussion here. Now what we're going to do is, this is the easy part, we've had the easy part, now we're going to open the floor to questions from the audience who I'm sure are champing at the bit to, um, to get down to business. So what we're going to do, uh, audience, is I'm sure you've got questions already. Um, I'll invite maybe three questions at a time, so if you, there will be microphones running around now. Uh, we will keep a couple here, I think, and um, we'll keep one microphone here, and uh, we'll pass the other microphones around the room. So if you put your hand up, and uh, we'll take questions. Three questions means it gives us time here at the panel to uh, assimilate some answers. I've also been sent some online questions, which I will go through while you're asking the questions, and pass and read them out at the next round. So, uh, I saw a hand up at that end there, um, the back, the second row. Uh, we'll start with you, then Patricia at the front. Thank you, uh, Lani. 
from the Alliance for Future Generation. I really love the topic for this evening's discussion and thank you to the panelists for the very enriching um, discussion of people-centered, sustainable blue economy. And my, it's not a question, but just a comment, my thesis comment. Uh, talking on people-centered, uh, you know, when we know that uh, as in this business as usual, that by 2050, that there will be more plastics in the ocean than fishes, when we have in the Pacific, you know, seabed mining exploration, these are really concerning to me as I am person as well as others. And uh, one of the things that I feel uh, should be a really important element of ensuring that we have a sustainable blue economy are uh, the elements of education, of awareness, of trainings, of public participation and also public access to information. And most of the whole reason we have a lot of you know, pollution and all other unsustainable ocean management uh, issues right now is because people are not informed of the effects of ocean and how they can also impact their lives with food uh, and you know, their livelihoods. And I feel that that is a really important element that we also need to be uh, discussing. Um, I know that the Siwakim Bao and Sloan law firm usually sends out bulletins. This is really good because uh, it gives more information about the technicalities that uh, you, they really break it down into simple uh, layman's terms that people can understand. And when I do get these bulletins, I'm always sharing it with other young people. And I think that's a challenge for all of us here that are working around, irrespective of what uh, industry, but if you're working around men and sustainable development, this is a really important uh, element that we also need to consider. Is how do we also engage young people? Because they are the drivers of a uh, sustainable blue economy system in years to come. So that's my two cents. Uh, comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lani. Uh, if I could have the microphone to the front. Uh, hello everyone and thank you very much for the panel for this uh, good discussion and good facilitation. Um, it's, uh, my name is Patricia Parkinson and I've been working in Fiji for various organizations that uh, are uh, currently in the public consultant. Um, it's just a bit of a reflection on what we talked about at the beginning, the definition of uh, blue economy, uh, because I think it's it echoes really very much what happened with sustainable development. Uh, if we say sustainable blue economy, isn't sustainability part of the definition of blue economy? And um, should there be, you know, there's various dimensions to the sustainability, so that echoes also a lot uh, sustainable development. So would it be, um, uh, relevant and maybe it has been done already, the development of principles uh, that uh, would be associated with the blue economy and that would make it much easier to integrate uh, the blue economy into the development plans, into legislations and policies, etc. Thank you, Patricia. We'll take one from the Pacific Environment Journalist Network. I'm interested in the, um, I'm inspired by um, Ms. Vinicius' comment at the very end of the previous discussion with regards to addressing conservation issues, but in the context of this marine conservation issues from the, from the context of the, the things that drive us to behave the way we do with respect to the natural resources that we own or have custodianship over. What, my question is directed at maybe Mr. Martel, and if, and if Mr. Sloan would like to answer, it's how much do you think is changing in the way governments are working with regards to ensuring equitable resources so that these, these driving forces are actually, uh, sorry, so that conservation is actually being 
uh, addressed from a root, root cause perspective as opposed to a band-aid solution which I think a lot of us see what's moving. Are we approaching this from a social justice point of view or are we looking at um, maybe an equitable share of resources so that the people who own the natural resources aren't driven to destroy what they have? Thank you, Lina. So we'll just ask Francois to perhaps um, address uh, Patricia's question and uh, Langley's comment, if necessary. Yeah. Well. You know, in this first Blue Economy Conference that we, we had in, uh, last year, we, we produced a conference uh, summary. So in there, you have a summary of what the people of the Pacific, you know, there were about 80 organizations that uh, came up, uh, about, about 250 participants, and, um, and about uh, 30, more than 30 countries that actually participated in the, in the conference. Um, and of this, uh, I think out of the 80 organizations, I haven't counted the full, uh, the, the full tally, but I think it's about 40 uh, CSOs or, or, or non-governmental organizations. So, uh, and I can assure you, many of them actually are, are part of Pringle. In fact, most of them are part of Pringle or part of, or part of the conference. So a lot of these uh, key elements and principles for a sustainable blue economy are actually in, embedded in the, in, the, in the new definition. But the idea of having the key principles is very important. Because it's for sure that the blue economy, is, there's this confusion over the dollar side. And because the blue economy includes all ocean activities, economic activities. That includes uh, coastal tourism, that includes uh, oil and gas, it includes deep sea mining. It, now the key question is, um, what are the principles of the sustainable blue economy? And, and I, I don't want to repeat it, I think you can read it in the document, but essentially it's to ensure the, ultimately, it's all activities that, that promote a healthy ocean um, and that provides uh, benefits to local communities. Um, one of the interesting things with, uh, with the conference and that came out strongly into the recommendation is that the foundation of the blue economy for the Pacific or sustainable blue economy for the Pacific is actually the coastal fisheries and the coastal and inshore fisheries so that the benefits accrued are accrued mainly by the communities and not only by the government. The, 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 the traditional blue economy definition is more about all economic benefits, uh, including oil and gas, uh, deep sea mining, uh, ocean, uh, ocean uh, afforestation, all sorts of elements. But I think if we keep to these basic principles, there are basic principles of human rights and human decency, and that's the main that's the, this is what we've retained from uh, the definition of the blue economy. So I hope it answers your question, uh, Patricia. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Francois. It does to, to some extent. But what I was wondering whether the, uh, at what stage is the development of specific principles that could be applicable uh, to the development of policies, to the development of uh, best practice for industries, to, so that it actually translates into real change rather than uh, it should be good for the environment and for the people. So if I could just respond because that's what I was thinking as well. Um, we're, we're talking a lot here around a very important thing which is a shift in culture or shift in practice. From what you've mentioned, from what Sarah in the back has uh, mentioned, what Lina's question has, uh, has as well. The key principles that can be understood from the top down are very, very important. And while I'm grateful for the explanation from Francois, I'm a bit concerned that the focus is only on talking about the coastal and offshore fisheries especially with the concerns of some communities and CSOs around things like deep sea mining and what that would mean in, in terms of the, the, the larger conversation. So I'm taking good notes and um, make sure that uh, um, and in the follow-up to this uh, document, we ensure that um, 
we can put a ton of knot together to look to focus on the basic principles. But I, I, I can assure you that uh, there's been a lot of talks over this. Um, Piango, uh, with many other uh, organizations, have actually organized already some uh, blue, blue economy, um, blue economy uh, workshops to ensure that um, they're starting to focus already on things. But I think it's a very good suggestion, and I totally agree with Jane that we, we should actually make sure that these principles are there. One of the key ones will be, for example, renewable. Because it has to be a renewable resource, so that, that would actually exclude activities such as deep sea mining. Thank you, Francois and uh, Reverend James. Uh, before I uh, ask Aliti and uh, James to address Lide's question, I would also like to read out another question that came in online. It's actually uh, pertinent to that question, so you can maybe address that together. Uh, the question is, it's directed to James Sloan. Do you feel enough is being done by CFOs to talk, to talk about, let me just put my glasses on, <laughs> to talk about sticky issues around how some, government some governments approach ocean governance to disempower local communities. Uh, there is no name attached to the online question. So perhaps you could address that with uh, Lila's uh, question. I think the the question um, is, is the, the, sorry. Your name is Lide. Ah, oh, Lide. Um, from Lide was about um, what's changing and what's driving people. Um, and I think it's it's a really complicated question because I think it, it means from really from a, a community level. And I think communities are seeing things changing. You know, if you if you do have the the good fortune to go and consult and listen to communities, they'll say that their fishing habits have changed a lot over time. You know, fish have got smaller um, and they're noticing, a, you know, a big difference. But what's changing um, in, and, and, you know, if you analyze, and it's a very difficult question, what is the, what is the driver of that change? And, and a lot of it, I think, is that, um, you know, people just want basic things. They want money um, and they might be, might be then um, fishing in a, in, a, in a less sustainable way because, for example, it's, it's much easier, it, you know, just to... to and it, it's a very difficult question for communities because, of course, the resources are owned communally. So certain members of that community might be going out and taking the resources and, and making money from it quite quickly, and that can deplete the resources. And, of course, you have other issues like poaching. But how do you change that? Um, is very difficult. And this is why a lot of the CSO work really isn't about um, diving and you know monitoring the reef and all that sort of stuff. It's actually working with people and figuring out how do you get people to change their their behaviour. But you also need to provide more opportunities for people to 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 make that income and make that money. And and I think a lot of that comes down to finding the right sort of structures. Because if you look, I mean, I've got had some direct experience of the Madawata coast up at the north, where you see the middlemen will come down from Mombasa and they'll offer quick money for, you know, beche de mer or anything that the community can provide. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody in that community is happy with that. It's just that some guys might be going out all night and diving for beche de mer because they want 60 or 80 dollars in their back pocket from the middleman. And other members of that community will be upset with, with what's happening. And it can cause an enormous amount of discord. So this is why I think a lot of the CSO work in solving this is, is it, it's about managing or figuring out what are the processes to build peace and, and, a, and a kind of cooperative approach within that community. And that can change. And I think there are also changes within government as well. I think government, um, as we know, they've been um, you know, hosting COP23 and the Oceans Conference last year at the UN. And there is a, a little bit more of a conservation agenda or the, it's, it's becoming more, you know, governments are becoming more aware it's important to use the resources more sustainably. And you can see that in some of the things that the Ministry of Fisheries is doing. So at the moment they have the Kawakawa and Donu ban. Um, they have banned um, beche de mer because of the health risks that are associated with it. 
But the challenge now is to come up with good regulation that aligns with what communities want as well. And I think a big challenge will be, how do you give to the communities more benefit from the use of their resources? How do you cut out the middlemen or regulate them better? <clears throat> and then how do you, how do you um, allow communities to realize that if they do have more sustainable fisheries management practices, that they'll get more from that? And that doesn't necessarily just mean money. I mean, it can mean in, in terms of food security, protein, at times of natural disasters and, and things like that. So I think that was the easy question. Uh, well, it wasn't an easy question, but I think it's a bit easier than the, the, the online one. Are more governments aware that it's more effective to address the issues of poverty with, with regards to the owners of natural resource? Like, as you said exactly, do you see that, Mr. Martel? Do you see a shift in social justice? An understanding and realization that unless you address the underlying unequal distribution of, of uh, wealth, that you won't really effectively address um, environmental degradation? Um, to, to, to be honest, um, I'm not a practitioner anymore in the field like I used to be many years ago. And I work with many, many communities when actually I, I, I was working together with SEMA and SPREAD establishing community-based conservation areas. And, but I think, you know, when you consider the fact that I, I specifically mentioned that the, the focus and the priority for the blue economy should be focused on, on uh, coastal fisheries and intro fisheries and working with local communities, I think what you will find out is that there is a, there is a, 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 a big difference into the investment by governments into the commercial fisheries and to the coastal and intro fisheries. And, um, I, and I'm not an expert in, in, in fisheries, but uh, all the elements that are, that, uh, all the, 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 the because the, the large amount of revenue to the government comes from commercial fisheries, I think the attention has been put towards uh, regulating IUU uh, uh, and, and also the enforcement of, of the main uh, regulations established. So I think there's a, a strong emphasis on commercial fisheries and less emphasis on coastal fisheries. Now, is if, if, if there's a recognition that there is a link in relation to um, uh, 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 justice uh, in terms of uh, in, in, I mean, in poverty reduction, um, it's, it's a bit um, difficult to, to say. One of the key areas where I was working in the past was to, when we identify conservation areas and we have community champions that are willing to actually push for this, is to look for incentives or community incentive or nature-based uh, incentives to actually um, uh, f uh, to compensate for the loss of revenues that they would have normally incurred if if they um, they would exploit the resource. And we, we I think most uh, CSOs that operate uh, on the natural resource management areas in the, in the Pacific actually uses a lot of this actually these, these practices and trying to introduce them alternative uh, you, uh, alternative uh, uh, ways of uh, generating income um, and so, so the, this particular element is addressed with uh, with the um, uh, with this from the CSO's perspective from the government perspective I think it's still uh, they're still very far in in, um, in implementing um, what would be a more holistic approach towards the management of the natural resources that will benefit the local community that's, that's my personal opinion. And I'm, I'm not talking about Fiji, I'm talking about uh, across the Pacific Islands. And uh, uh, you know, we worked in establishing conservation areas in Palau, in, in, in Micronesia, in Tonga, in, in Tuvalu, Kiribati, uh, Samoa. So it's, it's, um, it's still something that, we need, that needs to be addressed. But I think there is a, 
there's a trend in the right direction. Let's put it this way. In response to first uh, Lani's uh, comment on the, the lack of information, I think that's a uh, Maybe an issue that we really need to, to talk about and think about. How do we get the information, the communication? What kind of communication strategies are we using? I see Dr. Inga sitting at the back there, uh, the Tony Lady, she's a communication person for the history for the SPC. This, this is the kind, of, the kind of questions that you grapple with. What kind of information are you giving out and how, you, how do you give it to people? We have the internet, we have technology, we have all these things. And how do we make sure that the person that's using the resources gets that information and the right information. Because otherwise, like we talked about custodians and ownership. Even those two terms, when you talk about to them, to the community and tell them we don't own the resources in Inonda, we're just custodians, it changes the whole concept of how they see the resource. It's getting that information through to them. So the education and training, the need for that. And uh, like Sarlani uh, raised for the importance of having young people. This has been an ongoing thing in the Pacific, I remember it some maybe years back we were talking about why are there not many young women, for example, interested in doing work on women fisheries and looking at what women are doing in communities. And I think for the community, you know, to address what Lydia was saying, we, for, the, for the topic for this discussion, for example, we are talking about strengthening institutions. The questions we need to ask is, what institutions are we talking about? For example, in Fiji, are we going to strengthen the provincial councils to the Tikina council to the village to run any corner? Through that system, if you look at it, the woman falls through that gap. Because you hardly have women who are sitting in those positions. There are some, like in Amosi, there's a district, the, the Tikina Red is a woman, and there's a system Roku in Ra, but I can count them with my fingers. There's not many. So, what kind of institutions are we talking about? Maybe the church institutions, maybe the institutions at community level. These need to be strengthened. How do we strengthen them? And when we are talking about inclusiveness, the NGOs in Fiji, for example, we help you do PRA, participatory rural appraisal, you do all these, the wonderful tools that we use at community, they draw maps, we talk to, the, to them, but sometimes, when, what struck me this, this evening when we asked the first question, nobody raised their hands, nobody said anything. It's uh, like the culture of silence, right? people don't talk. Imagine the people in the community, imagine that woman in the community. Yes, you have the right tools, you're asking the right questions, but how does she say it? Those are the kind of challenges that we really need to still think about and, and be part of this discussion. You are talking about inclusiveness, you are talking about institutional strengthening, and we need to really know what we are trying to do. Okay, uh, maybe we can take some questions. We've got one at the back. And, uh, okay, these, these people have microphones, so let's speak from that side. Thank you, uh, Lysia Sator. Uh, this probably uh, goes toward uh, Alisi. Uh, this is just uh, regards to women with disability and girls. Uh, is there any work or related uh, documents that uh, covers this issue in regards to blue economy? Thank you. disconnect 
between the macro and the micro. There's a lot of discussion up, up in the, at regional, international, and uh, whatever levels, even national. The resource owners are really uninformed. That's why the guy at the back there is quite correct. Uh, I do not know why this disconnect. I, I mean, there's conferences uh, and meetings and whatever, and, and um, papers are taken out, position papers and all, but it's not getting there. What is, uh, I mean, and we're expecting them as resource owners to be uh, doing something about it. Otherwise, we are all uh, telling them what to do. I, I mean, it's very much against, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really wrong. And we expect a lot from them, but we're not informing them. So that disconnect needs to be uh, addressed by some groups who have the, the powers that be, so to speak. And, and secondly, I'd like to say that uh, every uh, time there's a new conversation for a development agenda, there's a new, a new term, new terminology, new concept coming up, and no one is translating them, or no one is demystifying it, so to speak. I mean, look at blue economy. I can't even know what. To, how would you say it in uh, native Fijian? <laughs> <laughs> or even in Hindi, or even in Tongan, or someone for that matter. How do you say that? And uh, stewardship. You know, there's a lot of. I mean, love, uh, warm and fuzzy, lovely terms that needs to be uh, shared, but no one's uh, giving us translation. So James Bakwan might want to be looking to these kind of things. <laughs> Thank you. And just lastly, uh, I was listening to James the lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James, for informing us of uh, all these uh, various, um, what do we say, levels of, um, if it was a concentric circle, uh, uh, fisheries, uh, you know, the fishing areas, eh? archipelagic, archipelagic, and, uh, but I think, um, you know, uh, we can only, uh, Resource owners can only mend what they can see. How far their sight can go, so now how much the technology they have to be able to reach that uh, outer boundary, so to speak. So if your fissure is, uh, is quite big in the Pacific, uh, this is not only in Fiji, it's everywhere in the Pacific. How your far your eyes can see, and if you have the technology, it's a boat that can, uh, you know, or the canoe that can go that far. And I think somebody's not giving resource owners uh, anything. That's why James, uh, the preacher, is saying, even in Lomaiwiti, they have uh, trawlers coming in at night, crawling in to fish at uh, the, you know, areas that are owned by traditional owners. Eh? I just don't know. But nobody's looking at this. Nobody gives them boats with an engine they expected to paddle or something. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Tisla Thank you. Um, who has the courage to take on these questions? <laughs> Okay. I won't thump any pulpits, but <clears throat> I want to start with our young uh, uh, representative from the Boa Youth, uh, Boa, Boa Urban Youth, yeah? Basumadwata, but it's okay, never mind. Uh, <clears throat> no, but this is the thing we're talking about in terms of partnership. Wait, I'll come to you. No, but in terms of partnership with 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 traditional and non-traditional understanding of who are CSOs, I was thinking. I wonder how many organisations CSOs work with the women's fellowship in churches instead of just going and doing the. Well, we want to meet with the you know, target work with with those institutions which are nationwide within the church structures, looking at structures that are already. Our Sunday schools, uh, and the the entry point is already there. Pacific Conference of Churches, member of Pringles, Methodist Church in Fiji, member of uh, PCC, already has accepted the uh, the concept of uh, uh, green church stewardship. And it's not about the translation of the word; it's about the translation of the concept. It's what you understand. So. It's technical translation, it's about translation of a thing, of a practice, of a principle. And this is again, we come back to the principles. But how we can address those things. And I think it's, 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 it's about being a little bit more creative and not being perhaps so tied to... I mean, I'm really grateful that CSOs in the Pacific are engaging with faith-based communities. 
because it's a recognition of the role that we play in the community. But I think it can be smarter if instead of just coming to deliver a, 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 a package, you actually have the consultation in developing the process as well. Naka. Uh, first, I'll address also the. I'll also address the uh, the, young, the young men's question. Oh yeah. Um, uh, particularly for for elements of sustainability, there is out there a lot of very good material that could actually be promoted as part of the curriculum for primary and secondary schools. Um, and hopefully, if you remember, for those who were at the conference, we had Gunter Pauli. Gunter Pauli, what we call him the, the, the Steve Job of sustainability. Um, and, and Gunter has produced about 350 fables or children's stories, uh, all about sustainability. Ocean, water, climate, everything. But it's actually written for children. And it's actually to be written in vernacular language. So essentially, uh, for, so for, for example, for Fiji, we have uh, the, at the PIDF, so we started this initiative together with uh, Gunter to actually acquire, the, acquire the, uh, the copyrights so that we can actually translate these stories into vernacular language in Fijian, in Hindustani, and, and in, uh, in English, actually, trilingual uh, series. But we, we're still struggling a bit with the financing and also with the engagement with the Ministry of Education to ensure that these books could actually be printed and they could be printed um, uh, and, and then incorporated into the curriculum for, uh, for um, uh, particularly the primary, school, the primary schools. And uh, I totally agree with uh, the issue of the vernacular language. I remember when I was in Samoa, and, uh, in my first years in Samoa, and we wanted to form a, uh, an organization for the conservation of the environment. And in Samoan, there was no word for the, ro for the, world, for the word environment. So, so actually a group of uh, Samoans actually sat down and had a, a telanoa to decide exactly what kind of word we're going to be used. What will be representing the word environment in, in that vernacular language? And the, the word is siosiomanga. Um, now everybody used the word siosiomanga, but it, it, it's, it, it didn't exist, so it's, it was created. So I think that there, there is a role for CSOs in, in actually doing that level of, that level of, uh, of, of translation at some, at some level. But I, I would hope that this project will go through. The idea of the books are also printed on, on, uh, on, uh, on actually on what we call rock paper. So it's, it's made out of uh, waste uh, from mining. And so it's actually uh, renewable and uh, it can be washable. And so it's a, it's, it's a very good way to actually introduce the elements of uh, renewable resources to, to the kids. And I hope we'll be able to pull it off uh, for six countries uh, in the Pacific, um, but we, we, we're just needing a bit of financing. But this is something that we would love to be able to do with, uh, in partnership with uh, CSOs, and it could also be used for, um, uh, for the faith-based groups as well within the, within the Sunday schools. So I, I just wanted to, to, to focus on this. And um, to address the disconnect, well, this is a very, it's a very good question, because at the end of the day, uh, whether you are successful in implementing uh, na um, sustainable natural resource management and conservation, like the LMMAs, is, is you need to you need to basically send a message over in an outreach way, in such a way that you can get people to come to you, not the other way around. Uh, and I, I feel a bit guilty in, in that sense. My organization for a long time was focusing on protecting the priorities that the the area the most sensitive or the most what we used to call the hotspots of biodiversity. So we've identified the area and basically we zoom in in terms of our outreach and uh, in terms of awareness. And it's not and then eventually you reach a point where you find some champions and it works. But I think it should work the other way. So you, you need to have an outreach that is more global 
within, say, for example, for Fiji, indicating that you have these activities and you can do these things. And then for the people from the community, or at least one or two from the community, to come to basically say, we're interested. In my community, we are interested. And then I think it, it, it just uh, it just increased probably the level of the potential for success in, in establishing activities in, in that community. But that's, that is one way I see it, to try to address that discussion. Thank you. Just to answer the question on the mineral distributors. At the beginning, I talked about the need for the We're still using that term, and there's been a lot of discussion in the network to gender and future to be more inclusive. To answer your question, it's been a bit. At the moment, I'll be honest and say, well, we, yes, we are, where we come across it, but I think it's
sympathy with that point about acronyms and new terms coming out all the time. Um, I think one of the, the main things we should be thinking about is just making sure that the underlying rights don't change. These are the things that I think are very important um, in the Pacific context. But in terms of the young representative from Bua, I thought he, he made a really good point. And, and one of the things that occurred to me, and it's something I worry about, is how often do children, particularly in, in the urban centers, get a chance to actually get in the sea and actually go and visit a coral reef and see what it's actually like. I mean, I think that children in communities in outer islands get to do that, but we've got you know, huge amounts of school children in Suva that probably never get to see coral reef and fish, and I would like to see more opportunities um, for school children to actually get to the reef, in a, obviously in a safe way, but to be able to snorkel and see the fish, and, and, the, and I think that will probably be better than any other way of, um, you know, in terms of textbooks and papers and all the rest of it. Actually, the best way to do it would be just to get children in the water. Um, just, just a comment, and I think this is directed to the IDF. Um, it's just to follow up on uh, the, the disconnect that um, uh, them I had uh, mentioned. Uh, I totally agree with everything that you had said. Uh, but I think the onus is on uh, the, the powers that be. Um, you, the people who are organizing, uh, things for uh, at the national level to, to, to come down uh, rather than uh, expect the people to come to you uh, you have to find a way to come down to the people at the community level uh, just to give you an example um, uh, we were being um, invited to um, a, a conference a, a workshop for um, on fisheries and um, I would uh, like they were, we were given two places, so um, we wanted the women who are actually doing the fishing to, to get to that workshop. But I know they would not understand anything because everything would be conducted uh, in English and at a very high level. Of uh, you know, you'll be talking uh, all this uh, using all this jargon and whatnot which the, um, the village uh, women who are actually the ones doing um, the, the, the work down there, the fishing, would not understand. They, they would be lost. So there has to be some sort of a, um, a rethink about the way we are um, uh, organizing this uh, training um, and um, the, the dialogue. And quite often you hold things in uh, five-star uh, hotels. We are really poor, the NGOs are. We expected to go and take our um, delegates, pay for our delegates. Uh, we, we cannot ever afford to do that. So uh, two things there. It's the way you organize things, uh, the, the discussions about laws and whatnot. Uh, some of these things could be done in Fijian uh, at the community level. Thank you. I'll just make a, a very brief comment, and I, I absolutely uh, agree with you. Um, we, we, we try to organize smaller Talanoas in smaller places, and us, we don't have a very, believe me, we do not have a very big budget, so we tend to do this in our small conference room, and for those who have been in that, in that office, know that this is a very small conference room, where we try to pack about 25 people. <coughs> but I think the, the point I wanted to make is, is that I do agree. And this is, it, with the PIDF, the national platform for implementation of the PIDF strategy and plan and consultation and advice is actually a national platform. It's a platform that's meant to be multi-stakeholder and that implements the activities of the PIDF. Once we have these National Sustainable Development Board, whether they are existing structures or not, they are able then to actually implement their activities in the, in the language of the country where they are based. So this is the ultimate objective of the way the PIDF wants to operate in the future. But we, we, are, we are not there yet. We have only five National Sustainable Development Board established, and I'm afraid to say that the Fijian one 
is not yet established. But that's the responsibility of the government of Fiji as a member of PIDF. So, um, but we're almost there. And so then uh, many of the activities will then be uh, uh, coordinated through that national platform that will be in Fiji. So I hope this explains. So I just want to just add a, an example of a successful process, I think, is this uh, recent uh, legislation around Kawakawa and Donu, which is the result of a successful campaign that worked with communities, worked with churches, went to the those who were, uh, you know, went to the, the resource, not resource owners, but those who are out fishing, who get their livelihood from this fish, had the conversation about the value of protecting it during its spawning season, got them to, ch to champion it, got the churches involved, got the, the supermarkets involved, and it's through the conversations. So it is possible and it can be done, the education process. Uh, when it needs to be in English, it's in English. When it needs to be in Itoke, it's in Itoke. When it needs to be in Hindi, they still revert to English, but they, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, that, that, that process. And I think that's, that's the shift that we need to do, is how do we shift the culture around the conversation of the resource will always be there because it's always been there. So it doesn't matter whether I fish one fish or 50 fish, it's going to be there, to the fact that I've got to practice, change my practice to ensure the sustainability. So it's a, it's a strong cultural change also that needs to take place. But it's around the conversations that we have. So I really appreciate what you've uh, what you shared, Nak. Well, I've been given the warning that time is um, soon to be up and it's time to wrap up. I think that uh, uh, Reverend James's comment is probably a really good place to to stop and remind ourselves that this is this these discussions will continue, but these discussions have to continue in a different framework. We have to really change the conversation, change the culture in the way we think about whether you want to call it a blue economy or just sustainable development and the use of our ocean resources in whatever language, but we, need, we do need to look at how we can actually start thinking differently. And uh, the, the broad theme of this project is raising Pacific voices and we will be looking to the CSOs at all levels in terms of how we can engage both ways, from the government through, from the international through to the community, via the CSOs, and the other way around as well. So um, I'd like to now thank the panelists once again. I'm sure you'll have time to chat with them over uh, refreshments. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for being pretty awesome, um, for saying woohoo, and I hope you'll soon be able to say I loudly with your right hand raised. And, um, and participate in um, a sustainable blue economy for our Pacific's future. Minaka. On that note, thank you again, um, Singa, for just a wonderful facilitation in terms of trialing out something new rather than just having a panel that comes in and throws information at us. Just the way in which you, that you brought, that you, you got us involved right at the beginning. Um, you know, to engage, and this is something that that we are undertaking that together with the Pringle Alliance under the Raising Pacific Voices project uh, is to try, is to find other kinds of methodologies that and that allows us to engage and to talk about long-standing development issues. Yeah, and so the way in which you facilitated tonight's discussion, I think we can all lift up. Can we please, you know, for those of you who. Who, who, who found the method of facilitation was fantastic. Raise your right hand and say woohoo. Woohoo! <laughs> if you agree, I'm sure you can do a lot better than that. And also for the panelists that they gave you, you know, just more food for thought to go away and to say, you know, this is, we talked about sustainable development, we talked about appropriate technology, we talk about self determination, we've got the blue economy, we come at it from a women's rights perspective in terms of. You know, women are not just traders, we're part of the value chain. Count women's unpaid work. But in, in the new world of looking at the blue economy, we've got rights. 
and we had and to access our rights we've got responsibility so the legal component that you brought in uh, you know in terms of us knowing what our legal rights are and in terms of just look addressing the you know perspectives on the margin so thank you james for that and of course francois you're from pidf we didn't mean to have you as the government person that we would attend all the time but in the role of cso's our role is to hold governments accountable right and so tonight's dialogue is one way in which we hold governments accountable we do it in a way that's a talamore style and james thank you for reminding us that in for reminding NGOs that, you know, after the projects are done, the churches are still there. Because what you are saying to us, it's never been about the money or the project. The relationships that exist is the one that we have to work on. And the notion of custodianship and stewardship is not something that's alien to us. So, to all everyone who's here, for the panel, the game, and and to say thank you to Ocean News Center for opening up this space, raise both hands and say woohoo if you really like to like paddle. It's like the American. <laughs> but anyway, everyone, thank you so much uh, to everyone who will hear your words today. And your food is there. Let's have more conversations. And we look forward to having this in other parts of the region as well. Okay.